Welcome to Well Razor Radio. I'm your host, Joshua Coburn. With me, as always, is the mighty Shane Scala and sweet Simon Sanborn. Today's guest I'm super excited about, Robbie Ripple. You guys may have seen him on Spike TV's Ink Masters. He's a tattoo artist and all-around amazing individual. Um, he always talks about love as a special ingredient in life and tattooing. And he gets real with us. He gets honest and vulnerable. There may be a few tears. I mean, it's a super cool episode. I'm really excited for you guys to tune in. Check it out right now. Hey, welcome to Well Razor Radio. We got Robbie Ripoll on today as our guest. Welcome, sir. How you doing? Pretty damn good. How y'all doing? Great, great. Awesome. Thank you, by the way, again, one more time for... Uh, you know, dealing with some of this technical difficulty stuff and being super patient. We really appreciate it, buddy. That's okay, man. I'm on the road right now, so I understand uh, technical difficulties and having to go with the flow, so it's all right. Excellent. Thank you. Where are you at right now? Um, I'm in Connecticut in a place called New Milford. It's actually where they filmed Mr. Deeds. Uh, so I have officially named myself Mayor of Deeds Town when I'm here. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm at an awesome shop um, that my buddy Mark Duhan owns called Skin Deep Inc. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, just to dive right in here, if you don't mind, um, we were talking earlier that you were on uh, Spike TV's Ink Master Rivals, right? How was that? How'd you get into that? Um, well, it was, it was hard. Uh, it was probably one of the hardest and most rewarding things I've ever had to go through. Um, it, was, uh, it was weird because I tried out for season two. Uh, and didn't make it. Um, I got very far in the casting process, but it wasn't the thing for me at the time. I wasn't the guy they were looking for. And all of a sudden, season five comes around like a year or two later, and uh, I got a phone call. And they uh, asked me how I felt about my brother, and I said some really expletive deleted and told them <laughs> uh, <laughs> how I felt at the moment because uh, he and I have always had a really hard relationship, uh, actually, as we get older, even more so. Um, but uh, they were like, oh, you're an animal. We love you. So they brought me on and expected me to be this, like, angry, shit-talking bastard. And uh, I actually just wanted to be, like, the loving guy that I try to be at home. So it was a, it's a really odd experience. But um, I've never done TV production before, so I thought it was real when I went into reality TV, and it actually <laughs> wasn't. Right. Um, there's a lot of production. They, they didn't actually ask me to do or say anything I wasn't willing to do or say. Um, and like privately you know it was just always in group conversation but i was always the guy that wouldn't um but it was it was great man it gave me it gave me a lot of new doors it, it gave me a lot of newfound confidence because now when i walk into a room of tattooers i know the chances are they probably have at least heard my name and uh, that makes an introduction a lot easier because i'm one of those introverted extroverts you know <laughs> so uh, got it got it, it. Was, it was really nice to uh, have something that i could say hey you kind of know me so now i can say hello um but, I mean, it, it's brought a lot of wonderful things for me. I mean, what else are you going to get $3 million in free advertising uh, right. you know totally. I mean, for, for, for your business? Right. Because you know, I, am, I am my business. So uh, it was crazy. But it was hard leaving the family. My poor wife, she was 23 at the time and never ran a tattoo shop before and had to run my tattoo shop for me. Oh, yeah. Um, so it was, it was a struggle. And the struggle is definitely real. But um, – it's a beautiful thing. It's brought wonderful things to my life. Um, it was just, you pay for it. You definitely pay for that exposure somewhere or another. Hey, Robbie, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I've watched Ink Master uh, a couple of times. And when I, I, I really liked it to begin with because I wanted to see how this is all going to come out and the talent of different people and what people can come up with. But what bothered me about the show, and I was wondering if this bothered you as an artist, was the fact that it was how are these tattoo artists dealing with I'm competing, I have a time constraint, uh, my name is on this piece of artwork, and uh, am I going to be able to give that client, that person, the best tattoo I can? Did you war yeah. with that at all? Uh, dude, it's, it's terrible because, I mean, typically – I'm, it's me and you, you're my client. I'm your artist. I care about you and I want to give you the best piece possible. Well, now I got to think about three other dudes 
um, and a whole production staff of, you know, because, I mean, production isn't really judging you, but the judges all have earpieces in, so maybe they are. Um, so, you know, you don't really get, like, I don't get to sit down with my client, talk the ideas out, draw it freehand on the skin, and then be like, hey, man, I'll see you in a, in a month for this to heal, and then we'll go back through and, like, make this perfect, or, you know, add to it, like, I do large scale stuff. Um, I operate from the heart. I always listen to music. I always sing when I tattoo. I always get goofy. And it's it's really hard to do that when you're there because you're not in your home. They, and it's weird. Like the first day I got there, I was in a ball in the corner crying my face off um, because wow. it was just so uncomfortable being there. Um, I didn't know how to act. Uh, they're telling me this is your home and this is your studio. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> this is a warehouse in a Portuguese ghetto in New Jersey. So <laughs> <laughs> this is not my home. This is not my tattoo studio. My wonderful wife and child aren't here and my dogs aren't running around. So <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's, it, it was very weird. They take you out of your comfort zone and they expect you to do what you do at home um, for their $100,000. Wow. And it's like, how bad do you want to sell your soul to the TV gods? You know, I'm not going to necessarily call it the devil because, I mean, it's all about perspective. But, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty rough because you don't get to do what you do at home. But it's, you're supposed to put out what you put out at home. It's really interesting. You bring up uh, the fact earlier that they kind of expected you to fill this kind of role of, well, a role, you know, and it wasn't yeah. necessarily your role, even though you had this kind of rivalry with your brother. But to go back to kind of what your website says and some of that info, you mentioned that uh, love's your special ingredient in life and tattooing. They expe essentially expected the complete opposite of that from you, it sounds like. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, look at the promo photos. You don't see one of me smiling. Um, you know, it's always me and my brother looking like we're going to kill each other. And that was what they produced us to do. You know, like my signature move is two thumbs up with a big fat smile. You know, like that's my <laughs> favorite picture, man. And they wouldn't let me do that guy. You know, uh -huh. they, they had me be the angry guy. And, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a big, angry looking dude, but I got a heart on my face for fuck's sake. You know, like, <laughs> let's be honest. I <laughs> gotcha. You know? you know, like, I want to I want to show the love. I know I can be a really terrible person. So I want to be the best version of me, not the worst version of me. But the best version of me doesn't get ratings on Ink Master. It would get ratings on Lifetime Television for Women. You know? <laughs> so, I can relate. And do you bump into that sometimes, Robbie, where you're, people are assuming that because you are... Um, a tattoo artist or you're tattooed or you've been on these shows that this persona is tattooed people are kind of these mean gruff kind of uh personas you bump into that quite a bit um you know being heavily tattooed and i'm sure josh can associate with this uh even more so than you uh because when you have hands and face and neck you know people kind of look at like look at you like you're gonna you know steal and eat their children um, <laughs> only sometimes you're going to eat the children, right? <laughs> exactly. Only sometimes I will steal them. Cause I mean, they're good free labor. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> Not true. <So> Disclaimer. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, uh, people, people have their own judgments. A lot of tattoo artists have preconceived notions about who I am. Um, some of my very good friends now hated me just because I was on TV and, uh, you know, I walk over to them, I say hello and I tell them how much I respect their work. And they're like, man, I feel like a jerk, you know? So um, you get a lot of that. I, I get a lot of clients or not even clients as much um, fans or people that watch the show that'll come up and be like, so uh, how's your brother? You know, like with a real condescending tone to try and stir up drama. Um, so the preconceived notions are there in many different ways. Uh, and I just have to be a grown up and deal with it. You know, I used to be affected by how people talk to me and now I try to be unaffected and, you know, find my inner peace and just allow them to judge and smile like I'm stupid and <laughs> walk away with, you know, a, you know, good love and, and some good knowledge. So it's know? almost like you take it as a challenge to make sure that you're doing the opposite of what they expect you to do. I mean, I know Josh kind of feels that way about it, too, that people are, absolutely. you know, people are judging you. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and that's just that's the decision you have to make. And I mean, Josh talks about that in some of the, in his uh, seminars with the kids, you know, how tattoos kind of made him feel normal until it made people look at him weird. And then he hated the people for looking at him weird. I went through that, man. You know what I mean? So it, it has to become a challenge. Otherwise you're just going to be miserable. 
Right. Absolutely. I can so relate to that. That was, like you mentioned, <laughs> it was like my whole life, everything yep. that I wanted to be, I became. And then suddenly I was like an enemy all over again. It's it's this big kind of vicious cycle. We talk about that absolutely. a lot. But um, yeah. going back a ways, like you've been in, in and around the tattoo industry for years and years and years, right? I mean, you started tattooing when you were very young, didn't you? My whole life, dude. Um, in fifth grade, uh, I, or third, fourth grade, I think I was getting dropped off at my dad's tattoo shop after school, um, which was actually a room in my mom's nail salon at the time. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I started from the bottom. Now I'm here. You know, I mean, really, it was just like I've I've been in it my whole life. Uh, I was the yappy kid dog type, you know, that was like, dad, dad, I want a tattoo. I want a tattoo. I want a tattoo. So uh, I finally bugged him enough where he started teaching me a tattoo. Uh, I started an informal, pre- an informal apprenticeship around 12. Um, and I started tattooing professionally at 16. Wow. Um, and uh, successfully earned my nickname, The Butcher, as a child tattooer. Uh, <laughs> because I chewed a kid's foot up so bad that uh, they, there was rumors that it had to be amputated. Wow. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And that was when I was tattooing in high school. Um, so yeah, man. And that was all in my hometown that I still live in. Wow. So it's really weird that uh, I kind of, I, I really, I drug my name through the dirt and then polished it, shined it and brought it back. Sin. So uh, yeah, but it's been, I mean, I'm 35 now, you know, and I was 16 when I started. So, so. And wow. 12 when I was like getting into it, like my dad had a body jewelry company and I used to polish body jewelry. I used to hand make the tattoo needles for him. I would clean everybody's tubes in the shop. Like I was the guy that was ready to do anything I had to do to become the tattoo I wanted to be because there was no way I was going to do anything other than a tattoo. Like that was it. I couldn't find a job in vocabulary and spelling bees. So I just figured <laughs> tattooing was the way to go. <laughs> that, that actually brings up a, a really good point. Something I wanted to ask, like, Obviously, being in this industry, in the tattoo industry, um, and, and not only does it generally bring some kind of crazy nickname with it, so it's interesting you brought that up. I wanted to ask about that, but uh, now I know I'm going to start calling you the butcher. But um, <laughs> that's, a sick, that's a sick nickname. Yeah, it kind it. of is. It kind of you're is. right. And unless you're a tattooer with a heart tattooed on your face, oh, and you want right. people to not be afraid of you. <laughs> a walking contradiction. <laughs> yeah, I'm a starburst. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> but hey, for real, like going, excuse me, no, uh, you know, going back to your point, like you were young when you got into this and you mentioned that, you know, you weren't going to find a job doing anything else. How do you feel kind of about that being heavily tattooed? I mean, we're starting to see people get into like uh, the corporate world. I mean, I've been there. You see people, you know, teachers that are heavily tattooed. You start really seeing people permeate you know, other areas of life. But back in the day, man, never. Was yeah. that a struggle with you? Um, not really, man. Cause I, the only struggle was I got to be a tattooer my whole life. Like that's all it was. Like I didn't think of anything else up until recently. I've wanted to start branching out into other forms of, uh, I guess life work. Uh, you know, I'm, my dad always told me you don't want to work for anybody, you know, so I've got a very entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and I love tattooing. I'm never going to stop doing it. Uh, and I know regardless of what I look like, I'll survive, I'll succeed, and I'll kick ass because that's yeah. just what I was intended to do. That's what I was put on this earth for. Uh, so as a child, yeah, I was like, oh, nothing other than tattooing. Well, I've really accomplished a ton in tattooing. So now it's like, well, I wouldn't mind trying something different. And I know I can. So, I mean, uh Hence things like this, you know, I mean, uh, just getting, getting out there with other, with other avenues and, and, uh, you know, promoting myself as a human rather than just a tattooer. And, uh, I've, I don't know where life's going to take me, but I know that I've got all the abilities now, regardless of how many tattoos I have, which is really cool in this changing world because that's not the way it always has been. And now I'm very happy that my son, you know, who's 15 can grow up knowing that he's going to get top-notch sleeve work from top-notch tattooers and be able to do whatever he wants in life, regardless of of his tattoos. And people will look at him and say, oh my God, do you know somebody or how much do you have invested in your work? Because his collection is going to be so slick. That's a really interesting way of phrasing somebody that has tattoos is, 
you know, how much money do you have in your collection? Like you're Absolutely. like you're an art gallery. Like yeah. you own an art gallery, <laughs> and this is how much I've invested into that art gallery, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, that's super yeah. unique. I mean, What's up? I think that's super unique way of looking at it because a lot of people who don't have a ton of tattoos look at tattoos and go, for like my wife, for instance, I would love to have a little bit more tattoos. She goes, that's great, but first we should probably do a few things like pay off the mortgage and get the kids yep. through college and all that stuff. But they, she doesn't look at it like, look at that great piece of artwork that we purchased and we put <laughs> on the wall. You know, it's not like yeah. a gallery for her, but that's unique. Yeah. I like the, how you phrase that about tattoos on people. Thank you. I have a, a, a question for you here. Um, for me, tattoos are like, I have a few. And for me, tattoos are like bookmarks in your life. Things that remind you of a certain point in your life. Uh, whether it's good or bad, because you have people that, you know, they have kids or there's a, a, a particular life changing event that happens. So they get a tattoo to mark that event in their life. Do you have any stories of clients that come in and you do a specific tattoo for them that have moved you or have oh. become part of you? Okay. Um, it's funny you say that because I started giggling uh, because yesterday at the shop I'm at, I did a bunch of little banger walk ins. And they were all like, with the exception of the first three, were all just like really heavy pieces. Like the one girl had a miscarriage the day before. So she came and got um, a, a butterfly with the miscarriage awareness colors in it. Um, mm -hmm. And she was upbeat and it was good. But I know I gave her some smiles and some love and some joy with it. Um, but then after that, um, a lady and a younger woman both came in. Uh, the lady's son died recently from a drug overdose and they both wanted to get commem commemorative tattoos. And like they came in and I gave them hugs before we even consulted, before we did paperwork because like I heard their story and uh, they both cried on my shoulder and uh, we did the tattoos. But the one story for me that really resonated was uh, a little less recent, probably like four or five months ago. Um, a good friend of mine who is a cancer survivor uh, recommended me to uh, a woman whose daughter was 16 and passed away from cancer. And um, in our fucking, whew, this is a hard one. <laughs> um, we're sitting there and we're having our consult. And I started thinking about like losing a 16 year old kid, you know, my son's 15. So it was really hard for me. And to grasp that, I mean, it still obviously moves me to a level that's hard to control myself. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that was that was a tough one, and uh, it was a beautiful time for us. And I, I really felt good because I was able to help her through something that really sucks. You know, I mean, not. <laughs> Sucks dick more than losing your kid. <laughs> you know, her teenager who was a beautiful, like blossoming child. Right. Um, so that really resonated hard for me. It hit home big time. Um Are those the things that really affect you the most? Is when you I mean, you really are giving somebody a gift, you're giving somebody closure, you're really helping somebody heal. So you're almost yeah. like, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it sounds very therapeutic and it, it I mean, can it must be, be really, them. really fulfilling. Well, I mean, it, it sounds therapeutic for you too. I mean, it's, it's, you're really giving of yourself for somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, that's what it goes back to my slogan, always using love as my number one ingredient. I've never used slogans except for that one because it's true. Um, and I, I abandoned that slogan for a while after the ink mastery thing. Cause I just, you know, thought, you know, it was cheesy. And then I found my heart and soul again in tattooing. And uh, yeah, man, it, I give so much of my soul to these people. And sometimes they don't, they really don't understand. God, I'm still choked up from that story. <laughs> You're doing um, great. They, they sometimes don't understand, you know, how, you know, how it can go uh, for us. You know, like if, if a client is unhappy with a piece, you know, it breaks my heart. You know, it doesn't just make me sad. You know, um, if a client's enthralled with a piece, it, brings me joy and elation you know it doesn't just it's not just oh cool you're stoked with it i'm glad you know it's like holy shit i'm so happy that my heart and your heart were able to intertwine on a tattoo 
you know, something that when I started, I didn't realize it was going to be this meaningful for me. But um, when I when I had one of the hardest times in my life, closing my big studio, uh, I was contemplating suicide and all that crazy stuff. Um, I just realized that I wanted to do my soul's work and my life's work. I didn't want to just tattoo anymore. And since then, I feel like I kind of shot myself in the foot because now my clients can make me cry a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me add by saying that that to me is what – I don't know you very well, Robbie, except for the last few minutes together. But it to me is what maybe probably defines you uh, different than other tattoo artists because you are Thank so you. invested and that emotion comes through. And uh, the idea that you're adding your kind of your perspective and your love to something like that and giving something that gift is – is uh, really touching. So it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, Josh, this wasn't, we didn't script this, but yesterday I went over to my mom's place to see if I can help her out with some stuff. And uh, we ended up, she ended up saying, you know, I don't need you for any of these projects, but can we sit down and talk for a while? Uh, yeah. And, w and I had asked her, I said, well, before you know, we kind of get into what you wanted to talk to me about, I have a question for you. I'm going to be a part of this new show, and there's going to be some really heavy things that are going to be talked about, and uh, would you be okay if I brought up this or brought, uh, brought up that about you know, my childhood and growing up and stuff like that? And she said, you know, I, I feel totally fine with that. I, I'm at peace with who I am right now. And Beautiful. Uh, you know, we started talking about uh, anger and perspective, and, and we had like this two-hour conversation. I said, I wish I would have had the cameras and the microphones rolling because this would have been a great podcast. Yeah, wow. But one of her comments to me, which goes back to what Robbie had briefly mentioned, was um, this thought of suicide when life gets really hard. And yeah. my mom had brought this up, and she goes, I really wish that we would stop with this um, this this feeling that we can't talk – we can't use that word. It's taboo to use that word. You know, let's not talk about it. So anytime anybody gets – it's not an alien feeling to feel no. like – the world is on your shoulders and you just can't deal with it anymore. And if we would just take that taboo, that label off of that word, people could talk about, I'm at a super low point in my life. You know, I, I the suicide thought has entered my mind. I don't want to go to the hospital. I just need some extra love right, right. now and right. support. Well, and I, I think Josh can probably relate to this too, that you – you working in schools and myself being a teacher that I hear it all the time. I mean, it's a, it's a constant discussion within schools and things like that because bullying is such a big thing now. Suicide is happening a lot from bullying as it, I think it probably always has just becoming more, people are becoming more aware now. But I mean, is that must be something that you hit on all the time? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that uh, to your point, Shane, that, you know, there, there is a stigma attached to that, to that word suicide. And, you know, it's it's because it's kind of scary. When I speak, you know, in front of sometimes thousands of individuals, I I mention specifically that I had the thought of choosing to end my life. Like you're nullifying something living, and you're ending it. Like that's huge. Mm -hmm. And I think that has a major impact to kind of say, oh my gosh, ending my life. And then everybody kind of internalizes that. I mean, I think it's huge because just. Just mentioning it, Robbie. Thank you for mentioning it as well. Just getting it out there, saying it out loud, kind of puts an ease on things. You know, it's like it's on the table. We can talk about it all day long. I mean, I was there. Obviously, Robbie, you were there when you when you struggled. I mean, for me, gosh, I was like um, well, fifteen the first time I thought about it. Really got serious about it at um, at age twenty, mm -hmm. and it was because of a lot of change, a lot of upheaval in my life. Robbie, you mentioned that. Uh, your thoughts of suicide really started to creep in when, when you were kind of dealing with a lot of change as well. When your your large studio was closing, correct? Absolutely, yeah. Because um, I had a small studio. It was awesome. It was cool. Uh, then I had a couple new artists coming in in the Piercer, so we upgraded to the super large studio. I had a super large house I was renting. I was just living this lavish life that I thought I was supposed to live, and I thought I was, I thought that's what I wanted. Um, and I was about 33, 34 at the time. It was, and I'm only 35 now. So it was like last year. 
Um, but I closed the studio and I didn't grasp the concept of failing forward at the time. I just felt like a failure. Um, and uh, I have, I'm not sure if you can see it, an I'm Rad tattoo. Ah, nice. Cool. Uh, that I got a long time ago to help me remember uh, in those times. And it didn't work. The tattoo didn't do shit for me because uh, I was so deep and I was so terrified of life. I didn't want a tattoo anymore. I didn't want to live anymore. I just wanted to sleep and be in bed. You know, like being around my wife was pretty much the only thing that made me feel better because she understands me more than most. And uh, I had this brief thought of suicide and it only came in for a few seconds. And because of her and my son, I pulled myself out of it immediately. I chastised myself. I told myself, this isn't acceptable and you have to move on. But I mean, dude, suicide is just as normal a feeling as guilt or jealousy or anger or happiness. You know, I mean, how many people haven't had that thought in their life? You know, I mean, you hit something really tough and you feel like you can't pull out of it. Well, ending it's going to be a lot easier, right? You know, so having that extra love and support and, and then just the mental wellness of just, just knowing, hey, I'm going to be okay. Everything heals. You know, the days continue with or without me. And, you know, even though I'm in an uh, inconceivable uh, place that I, I, I can't find the end right now, uh, I know that the end is going to come, regardless of if I know it's there. If I see it, I, I know it's there. Um, so it's, it's helped me to change my perspective. A lot. I mean, I started reading a lot of motiv motivational books, listening to a lot of audio books, uh, podcasts, um, YouTube videos. I I study your stuff, Josh. Oh, thank you. You know, like I, you know, I always I'm I'm always on the on the the social media trying to promote happiness and wellness and trying to find other things to fill my life with rather than sadness, depression, and fears. Because I realize that the more we operate out of fear, the worse our life is. So, you know, and one of my favorite quotes that I constantly see on the internet is on the other side of fear is exactly everything you've always wanted. Totally. And, uh, I think fear is a, I mean, suicide is a giant uh, fear-based thing. You know, we're just afraid of failure. So, or success, which is one of the things I realized I'm afraid of my own success. I'm afraid that I'm going to get as big as I've always wanted and make the money I've always wanted to make and be the change I've always wanted to be. And I guess I'm just afraid it's going to be too heavy for me, you know, or, or, you know, the, the, between the fear of failure, between the fear of too many people needing me, I, I'd probably rather do it easier sometimes, you know? So it's really weird. So I, I just try the mo most I can to get on the other side of fear. That's why I love uh, human body suspension. That's why I do it partially so much because you get past that fear and you find, find fun, man. I fly and most people aren't, aren't able to fly. It's like having a jetpack on. So it's, you know, it's a really cool something that I can get on the other side of fear. I was going to ask you, do you, Robbie, did you have anybody when you were growing up that kind of helped you be able to work through those things? I mean, I, I think of the same thing probably that you do about Josh and how inspirational he can be to kids and really bring these things to the forefront. Did you have anybody when you were younger that, or things that you knew or learned growing up that helped you get through some of those tough times? Besides, I mean, obviously you did some work as an adult, but as a kid, did you have anybody that stepped in and, and helped you out or did your dad kind of help you with those things? Um, my mom and dad were always there to, to tell me that I was a good person. Um, you know, they're always there to, to talk to me. My dad would give me books. Like he gave me a book called creating affluence one time. Um, uh, I can't remember the author, but it was a really cool book. I was just a very stubborn kid and it was hard for me to grasp what they were saying. You know, it was, I've had such limiting beliefs most of my life. Uh, I love my brother. I don't like him a lot of the time and the way he acts, but he was very good at trying to keep me down um, for his happiness. He's got a lot, a lot of demons. We all do. Um, and it's sad to see that our relationship has revolved around him keeping me under his thumb a lot. And he was my best friend mostly growing up. We moved around a lot, so I didn't really have friends. My brother was my friend. And uh, he kind of could manipulate me in the ways he could. So uh, it was weird. I didn't really have a whole lot of people pulling me up because... I couldn't get there between my outside influences and my own personal self. I just couldn't come out of it. Uh, granted, my dad was uh, one of my biggest inspirations most of my life because I mean, he was a Cuban refugee, came over here at 12 years old. And I mean, the guy has built, you know, quite, quite a good business for himself. And he just continued to build businesses. And he's always been an entrepreneur. And 
he was always the guy, you know, that was on top of doing his thing rather than what the people wanted him to do. Um, so that was a, that's always been a huge help to going my own way and trusting myself. But as parents do, they judge you. Uh, they don't like some of the things you do. So me being my own person didn't always go over well all the time. So it was a very hard way. Like I've never had anybody like Josh that would just love me unconditionally without judgment as a kid, you know, there was always judgment there, you know? So um, I think I had to get out of my own judgment zone to start finding the people that were going to judge me less. Nice. Yeah, you bring up a lot of a lot of amazing points there. I mean, you bring up the fact that sometimes you weren't always surrounded by great people, but now you're learning to surround yourself with more good people who build you up and and help you grow rather than tear you down or manipulate you or whatever. You also brought up the fact that you had to step away from your own judgment. You had to kind of remove yourself from that so you could see kind of how other people viewed you and everybody else. You know, those are super valid points. And um, I guess what I wanted to throw at you is as an adult, obviously you're still working on yourself. Do you still deal with that judgment? Do you process it quite the same as you did when you were 15 or 16? Uh, I don't even know that guy from 15 or 16 anymore. He was quite the douchebag. Um, you know, uh, we all were Robbie. We yeah, all, we yeah. all were absolutely yeah. Yeah, right. Um, and you know, I used to I used to punish people verbally because I'm really slick with my tongue. I grew up fat and I always got picked on, so I learned how to fight back with my words because my dad would kill me if I got any any less than A's and B's and came home beating up people at school. So I had to be ingenuitive. I had to find my way to win. Um, so I just started talking shit to people all the time. I was the best guy at just making you feel bad about yourself and then smiling about it and being like, ah, no, it's okay. We're friends. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like know, how it, it is my... in the studio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was my way of like passing my judgment of myself and them onto them, putting a smile on it and then acting like, Oh no, it's not that it's cool. Um, but now I find myself driving and I'm like this is stupid. And I'm like, no, no, this is somebody who's in a hurry, just like I am some days, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm really learning to stop that negative self-talk about myself and others. Um, and, you know, let's talk about the realest ever relationship with your spouse. There's sometimes my brain goes nuts talking bad about the woman that I love more than anyone I've ever met in my whole life, you know? And I have to tell my brain, hey, she's doing a great job she loves you and she's been yelled at you by, yelled at by you before she does not want to make you mad she's doing everything in her power to keep smiles and happiness and you know be the glue that holds a household together so you know i've really learned to stop judging and hating everyone around me and accepting that it's my own self hate it's my own self judgment i'm worried about myself and if i can nick that and if i can kill that then here we go now i'm a better human being and the people around me are going to benefit from it better. And then I'm going to benefit from it better. So Ooh, benefits are huge like all the way around when you stop talking bad about everything in your brain. It just takes a lot of work, and I do a lot of meditation. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's a lot of good insight. Uh, if, if I could sneak back just a little ways, uh, something that you and I are both very familiar with, I, my coming from the body modification world back in the day, yeah. and and providing the service of suspension for people. You mentioned how that kind of changed you a bit. And I know, Shane, you had some questions kind of regarding um, suspensions and stuff like that for Robbie, right? Well, you know, for people who don't understand or who have never heard of suspension, Robbie, can you can you uh, explain what suspension is? And then we'll kind of – I kind of want you to go into like what prompted you to go into suspension. Okay. Um, suspension – the long and the short of it is they put hooks in you. They pierce you. They put hooks in you. Uh, they pick you up off the ground and you receive a feeling or emotion or a, a mindset or a state of being from it. Um, for me, I started suspending because I read a book called Return to the Tribal uh, many years ago. And I saw Fakir Musafar doing his Okipa, which is a chest suspension. And it was a very ritualistic thing. So I started looking into it. And then I started reading about Fakir. Um, and Fakir does suspension from a spirit-based sense. 
Uh, he gets in tune with himself. He gets in tune with nature. He gets in tune with his surroundings. And it's about pushing yourself to these levels of achievement and accomplishment that you really couldn't receive in such an intense manner anywhere else in such a short amount of time. Um, so about 2011 came around. I finally had the balls to do it. I traded somebody at a convention for, I gave a tattoo to his wife and he had his apprentice, uh, put me up for my first suspension from my back. And it was amazing. Uh, it was so moving. I almost cried when I was in front of a group full of people and I wasn't as self-aware back then. So I wasn't able to cry in public groups. Um, so I held it in. And then my second suspension, I bawled my face off. Uh, because it was in my backyard and my whole family was around and my brother was there and he also got suspended. My mom and dad were there and uh, my my wife, who wasn't my wife at the time, was there and my son was there. And they were all like cheering me on and it was great because everybody was so excited to like see everybody go up, you know, because it was so inconceivable for all of us, you know, because it was so brand new to all of us. You know, I introduced suspension to my whole family. Um, so you get pierced that that day right then and there, that day right you then get and there. pierced and then they suspend you yes yes so okay you've got anticipation of getting piercings sure you, you've got anticipation of coming off the ground and then you've got the fear of dying or you know you know the skin ripping and stuff sure. like that oh, when you're gosh. when you're when you're when you're newer into it now sure. i don't have the fear of ripping anymore now i know that if you tear uh you know your practitioner is going to sew you up you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's not the end of the world. And if you tear out completely, you do have another hook in you, you know, unless you're doing a single point or you may have multiple hooks in you. But a lot of the time, the tearing is very minimal um, and it doesn't do anything other than just cause you to have to come down uh, because you may rip all the way out. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's really wacky, man. But, yeah, they pierce you. They, they put hooks in you. Uh, they string you up. They pick you up and then they pull the hooks out of you. Uh, probably the most well-known, maybe by pop culture of sure. suspension is from the movie The Cell. Yes, I was thinking about that with Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah, I love that movie. So, absolutely. D do you feel like, in any way, that that gave like a negative connotation to suspension? Did it help yes. or hamper that uh, that mentality? I don't know if it helped or hampered, but yes, it has everything. It's given a negative face suspension, but it's actually true. You know, he was a sick, twisted individual. He needed something to come out of himself. And when you put yourself through that type of fear and pain and anticipation, you're going to go outside of yourself. So rather than drinking or drugs, it's an escape in a sense. And I used to be a crazy drunk. I used to love drinking, but now suspension is my favorite escape, you know? So uh, I, I think for people that don't know, yeah, it could have put a negative connotation on it, but it's a movie who really cares. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if you really care that much or really are that interested in suspension, you're going to look into it further than seeing it on the cell. And so, uh, you know, I feel like the people that are going to, that are going to live in their ignorance that don't want to know what the matrix is about will have a negative viewpoint on it. But you know, the people that are ready to take that blue pill and, you know, go for that ride, they're going to figure it out. You know? Right. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, that's a good point because as twisted as that person was, he was escaping the abuse that he suffered as a child. I mean, there is a part of that in that movie where exactly. you kind of have some, you people hate the idea of understanding somebody who is, Got, yep. is a tortured soul but Absolutely. Um, that was part of that movie for sure and so so the sundance idea is is that part of suspension for you or is that the gentleman you were speaking of because that's i little little big man was the first movie i ever saw with dustin hoffman as a kid that had uh -huh. the sundance in it and i remember that scene and that reminds me of suspension every time i think of it right um it's not as heavy uh because it's the sundance is more of something you you kind of have to do oh. uh you know, like it's it's a coming of age thing, um, but suspension was definitely a coming of age for me. You know, I literally walked around after my first suspension for probably about a month, having to tell myself, "Dude, you're not invincible. Stop thinking that way," because it was so powerful what I got from it. Um, so yeah, man, 
I think anything involving suspension, if it's pure of heart, is all going to basically come from the same place. But then there are guys that are like, oh, I'm such a badass. I can go for my chest the first time because everybody says it's scary and it hurts. You know, and that's the guy that's probably not going to come off the ground. And if he does, he's going to cry because of pain, not because of emotion. Right. Um, he probably won't take anything good out of it. And then he's going to beat himself up when he leaves because he did it for all the wrong reasons. Right. So, you know, I mean, really, uh, it's funny because a lot of the people that I suspend with say they love watching me suspend. And I'm one of their favorites because it's from such a, a deep, soulful place. You know, I, I either growl with this like crazy type of like, like screaming, like, Fuck yes! you know, <laughs> or I'm giggling my face off like a crazy person cutting the head off a cat. You know, like, <laughs> oh, poor well, I think part of it is that you're, you do so many of the things that you do in your life from such a joyful place. I think that that's probably why it's infectious and why people enjoy it so much. Have you ever suspended, Josh? Uh, you know what? I I provided the service a lot, but I actually never suspended. Yeah. And, you know, the reason I didn't, and, and this is a perfect kind of segue into the question I wanted to ask, because... I would provide that to somebody, and like Robbie mentioned when he tattoos, he connects in a way that people who yes. don't perform those kinds of things will never – now I'm going to get all emotional – will, will maybe right. never understand because I'll never forget. It was sunset, and you know I was, I was doing a, a resurrection suspension, which is um, six hooks in the front of a young lady. It was our first suspension. It was, you know, sunset, the shadows, you know, it was just the most amazing thing. And this girl was crying as we hoisted her up, and I'm crying. The other guy I was working with was crying, and it was the most intense thing in the world because you knew that all the pain that she had suffered because she'd been abused, she was taking it back. She was taking back her body from, you know, the people who took it from her. And it's unreal, like those feelings. So I never did suspend because I thought, you know what, I, I don't, I, I'm feeling it for them. And, and many times, you know, it wasn't just about me. Sure. So it was so intense. I just never did it. I, even today, I, like, I don't have a desire to do it because I did it for so many people. It was unbelievable. I was just going to say we might have a good gathering for Robbie and the three of us. We can all try it. Totally. <laughs> I'd be down I mean, for dude, it. I would, I, we, could, we could totally set that up. I would love something like yeah. that. Because you want to see four big dudes crying like bitches? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I do that all the time yeah. anyway. So okay, I'm cool. I do it, regularly so. as well. So, that, that's you know, Friday night if we, me. <laughs> <laughs> if, we could, if we could line it up in unison, you know, <laughs> that would be really fun. That'd be intense. Uh, like, well, you'll be in the Midwest soon, right? You got some conventions coming in Chicago, so it's not out of the yes. question, right? It's not. It's not out of the question. Yeah, I definitely, dude. You know, I I've been dying to come and just have some good some good soul time with you. So you know, uh, I'll definitely we'll we'll talk more about that for sure. Definitely, door is open. <laughs> See what you did, Cy. That's a big deal. Well, you know what, Robbie? You know what? You know what? Too, I'm going to be at a convention where the suspensions happen at the convention, so we could even meet at the Chicago convention. And, you know, maybe even do like some sort of cool little uh -oh. uh, private suspension meet in public, you know? Wow. Yeah, do, a, do a little before and after podcast. It'd be kind of cool, too, to see how it kind of affects, talk, you know? That'd be kind yeah. of Absolutely. Intense. Dude, we could, we could even do a video cast. You know what I'm saying? I mean, sure. they're, they're totally. it, well, all the people we know, all the things that we can make happen. I mean, shoot, it, this could be something to kind of educate the public a little bit on. What is it about? You know, and I, and I think too. I mean, Shane and I both talked about this. I'm I'll be 45 this year, and it's kind of I, I gave myself permission. I think over the last few years of just saying all these things I've been told that are not true. I'm going to try them, or all these things that yep. I don't know about. I'm just. I mean, I, I I'm halfway done with my life, give or take a few years probably. Yeah. So I feel like now I'm like now I'm really coming into you know into an opportunity to try to discover some of these things. So it I it, as the words escape my mouth. It's it scares me. It scares me to death, and now I have butterflies in my tummy. Yep. <laughs> but uh, it still makes me think that that's why I want to do it. Then it's I'm, yeah. I'm challenging myself, so I think that's that's a, that's a cool uh, opportunity to try. Uh, on the other side of fear, brother. On the other side there of fear. You, <laughs> yeah. you know, Robbie. Uh, on the other side of fear. It's a great quote. Yeah, yeah, I love that. On your Facebook page, I was checking you out and uh, came across this picture of a woman who had tattoos on her chest and uh correct me if i'm wrong but you somebody had posted that picture on facebook and then it had gotten pulled down and she was basically 
making her chest beautiful again after a double mastectomy. Yep. Yeah. Can you um, tell Kate a little bit is, about that. Kate is one of the unlucky lucky ones or lucky unlucky ones um, because she caught the lumps before they became, they were precancerous. Um, so she did uh, a, a preventative surgery to make sure that, you know, we could cut out all the cancers we could. Um, that was an amazing experience because Kate's a friend of mine. She's a client of mine. Um, and she's a, she's a vibrant person. Like the picture of her smiling with her shirt off and the new tattoos. Right. That that's Kate. Right. Like that, that's who she is. That's who she walks around being. That's the, that's the energy she puts into the universe. Even in bad relationships, she puts out good, good energy. Uh, even in hard times, she puts out good energy. So she was someone that needed that. Um, and it was funny because she made the appointment and she was like, oh, I just want the root chakra symbols where my nipples would be. And uh, in our consultation, I was like, look, dude, let's do a whole under boob carriage. It'll be, it'll be killer. And she's like, oh, I'm not ready. So the day of, she's like, I'm ready. I'm like, you asshole. All right, <laughs> fine. <laughs> so we planned. So I had to, on the spot, plan the rest of her piece. So, um, but it was beautiful because it was easy. You know, it was, it was a challenge, but it was an easy challenge, you know, partially because her radiant, you know, energy was just so vibrant and it was just so easy to deal with her. Um, and uh, she invited her surgeons to come and check it out. And that was a big deal for me because I'm like, man, we're making a difference here. This is cool, you know. And she was just so happy and just beautiful and smiley and, and awesome about it. And then we post, I, I posted the picture. I posted the picture on my Facebook. It got reported Facebook didn't pull it down. Um, they they looked into it. Okay. So in the meantime, I wanted to give the big middle finger to whoever did it. Uh, so <laughs> hashtag fuck cancer, right? Exactly. So um, I hit her up. I, I hit him up, and I was like, "Look, uh, check this out, guys. This photo was reported. Um, I want y'all to do me a favor and share it if y'all if y'all ever been, uh, you know, dealing with or, or been affected by cancer." And we got such a huge response. We got over 3,000 likes on my photo, on just my photo on Facebook. Um, we got over 2,000 shares, over 500 comments of support, a couple of assholes in there that got beat to shit by <laughs> anyone who didn't like what they had to say. So it was beautiful because some jerk off wants to say something negative. And then five other people are like, you're a loser. You go kill yourself. Or, you know, whatever wow, whatever they fit. wanted to say, like not, not saying that you need to fight negativity with negativity, but it was cool to see that people came together for her. Right. And, you know, she and I were messaging back and forth and she was like, this is so overwhelming. This is so cool. I'm so, I, I didn't realize that there was this much love for me out there in the world, you know, like this is awesome. So it helped her even more so to have, that outpouring of goodness after getting the tattoos that changed your life. I think in a lot of ways, um, individuals don't understand the level of strength that they're sharing in those moments. Like for her, she was kind of reclaiming herself and, you know, obviously showing a strength to her that she could do it. But the second you posted that photo, I mean, that's strength personified right there. She's being her. She's exposing herself. She's being vulnerable and, you know, showing the world this is me. So many people wear kind of a, a mask, you know, to, to hide pieces of, the, of themselves. And I think that's why it's so inspiring. I think that's why the support happens that way. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely, man. Because, you know, she was bare. She was bare chested, you know, and. It's, it's such a controversial topic that somebody reported it because they're sick or angry or stupid. But, you know, it was, I'm sure it wasn't the easiest thing for her to just take off her shirt, put a smile on and be on the internet for people to judge. You know, I mean, some people were like, oh, what are those going to look like when you're 60, you know? And like I said, there, there's just so much weird stuff that happened. And it's cool to see her really be able to reclaim herself. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, I believe because she was so bare and because she was so vulnerable, I believe that's why the love and the outpouring and the support really came through uh, because people could see it. You know, there's a, a, a recent story about the actress Ariel Winter from Modern Family. Uh, she was on the red carpet and somebody would made the comment, ew, you know, cover up those scars. Your scars are showing from her breast reduction. And, uh, you know, she just owned the scars saying, no, those scars are me now. 
Why would I hide yeah. me? That's that's me now. So that picture that you posted on Facebook uh, of that woman, Katie, saying, "No, this is this is me now," and I and I feel beautiful about who I am now. Yeah, that that's probably one of the most powerful messages that any woman across this world could get is just owning your own beauty. Your beauty is yours. You don't have to look yep. like this person over here. You don't have to look like that woman over there. You don't have to look like the cover girl model. This is you and you're gorgeous. Yep. yep. And you were able to and give I mean, her that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? We all need to find that inside of ourselves because we all battle with it. But it was just kind of cool that she got to really turn a negative into a positive. You know, because we all have to find it on our own. You know, Definitely. <laughs> uh, she went through a hard time and had some good feedback from some good things and then ended up being able to take all the good from it. So uh, she did find her, her inner beauty once again, I'm sure, from that. Because, you know, I, I looked at the picture of, uh, that, I, that I took on my phone of just the pre-drawing with the yellow Sharpie. Um, and her body didn't look as amazing before the tattoos, you know, like, you know, and it wasn't about her physical look. It wasn't about her anatomy. It was just about those tattoos really brought something to her that's mind blowing and staggering and phenomenal. And it really gave her back her, her womanhood and her femininity and in, a, in an odd way without nipples. Cause socially nipples are what's sexy. But we gave her her sexy back just by throwing some sick tattoos on her. Ah, some Justin, Justin Timberlake style right there, giving, giving sexy back, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, Absolutely. So to kind of wind things down a little bit, we like to do something we call the Fast Five, if you're cool with it. It's, Absolutely. It's five questions I'm going to ask fairly quickly. It's almost like a word association, just kind of like first thing that comes to your mind. And I'll be the one delivering them, so it's, it's quick and easy, but... Uh, I'm going to shoot them to you here and just whatever comes to mind, shoot right back, okay? Okay. All right. Kisses or hugs? Both. Ooh, good answer. <laughs> they kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite musical artist of all time? Ooh, boy. Oh, man, that's a rough one. This um, just turned into slow one. five, dude. Uh, Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix, good one. Nice. Okay, so boxing match. Rocky Balboa at his height, Rocky IV style, versus Mike Tyson in his prime. Who wins? Mike's going to beat him up, but Rocky's going to take the, take the title. Ah, nice. <laughs> 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 One piece of advice you wish you could give your 18-year-old self. Don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Cut and dry right there. Tough to argue that. <laughs> all right and lastly where can people find out what you're up to what's next for you where are you going to be where you're traveling to and how to reach you um uh honestly the simplest way just google me robbie rapole r-o-b-b-i-e-r-i-p-o-l-l -L. um but if you want a more direct track robbie rapole.com uh robbie rapole tattoo at gmail is how people can contact me about uh setting up appointments or any business stuff um, Facebook, Robbie Rapol, uh, and then also my fan page, Robbie Rapol Tattoo Studio. Um, those are great places to find me. Instagram is my most active social media aside from Facebook. Uh, that's also Robbie Rapol. Um, so basically, my name is everywhere on everything that you want to find me with. As long as you can figure out and remember how to spell my last name, then you're good to go. Yeah, could, could we also Google hot tattooer with heart on face? Will that get us you know, what we need? <laughs> I, I, would, I would prefer that. Um, I think we should start, start a hashtagging that. Oh, so yeah. maybe I'll start coming up in the Google searches. Nice. Yeah. Ha hashtag hot tattoo heart. I might, just, I might just put your picture that you have of yourself on your uh, other Facebook page of the wrecking ball. Yes. <laughs> and, and maybe I'll just like circulate that around because that, you – you really that own that is, well. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I, uh, I don't mind uh, being goofy. <laughs> um, and now since I've lost so much weight, I'm actually going to have to do another goofy one. I was thinking about doing the, the Kim Kardashian pictures that broke the internet. Ah, where she, yes. you know, so I was thinking about <laughs> doing something like that uh, for my next banner because that's my convention banner. 
banner and that was my business cards and my stickers for the longest time but i've lost 80 pounds since then so forming it awesome awesome well huge thanks to you sir for coming and hanging out with us today thank you so much for taking the time and robbie i gotta tell you you from not knowing you and and getting to know you a little bit here i'm glad the the world's a better place with you in it i like the 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 love you put out there and i really appreciate your perspective on the world i think it's uh it's pretty wonderful stuff Dude, you just gave me the warm and fuzzies all over. Like, I literally got a physical chill from that. Thank you so much, man, because confirmation is a hard thing to come by sometimes, uh, you know, especially about your character. And uh, the more I've been working on my character, the more I've been getting confirmation. So it really, it it, it helps. Thank you so much. I I appreciate you guys being there, uh, helping me spread what I'm doing and helping spread what you guys are doing, because you guys are pretty kick-ass yourselves. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Robbie, hopefully uh, I have the balls. I I really want to meet you, you know, face to face. I can't wait to see you uh, and hang out with you. And maybe, I hope, I have the balls to do the suspension because I would really like to try that. Dude, um, well, I'll get contact info for both of you guys from Josh. and uh, Or Josh, just set us up in a group text for all four of us to talk. And um, let's continue talking about it for Chicago. Uh, I mean, if not, I can always plan for you guys to come to Florida, have a nice weekend suspension, bro down getaway. Uh, I mean, there, there's a million and ten different ways we can do it, and I'd love to meet you guys. I'd love to suspend with you. I'd love to be your support team putting you up because, honestly, man, on the other side of suspension is, is a different mindset. Yeah, for, s- size, it in. sounds like it. Sai's pissing his pants already. No, so. I'm, I'm, <laughs> excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, and, and honestly, I used to get super terrified every time, but I've done it probably about 15 times now. So the terrifying nature is kind of going away. But yeah, terrified is normal, and that's why you have to do it if you're that terrified. There you go. Yep, money, <laughs> money where your mouth is, sir. Walk that talk. It's on. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's it. We got we got two big fellas trying to come up on some hooks. Hell yeah! <laughs> awesome. Don't make awesome. it worse, <laughs> <laughs> dude. I used to spend when I was over 300 pounds, right. and uh, when I did my first chest suspension, a guy that was almost 400 pounds, he was like, ha ha ha. 305, you're a baby. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there's huge guys, the huge guys that go up on hooks. It's just about how many hooks you need. The bigger you are, the more the more hooks you do, and it's safe all the way around. I'm going to no start more dieting right now. Cool, yeah. uh, vegetables, <laughs> vegetables from now on. Right. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Robbie. We will hopefully catch you in Chicago. We'll see. But thanks awesome. a lot for having uh, or for coming on today and chilling out with us. We appreciate it. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it. I uh, can't wait to do more with y'all. Excellent. You take care, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Take care, fellas. Have yeah. a good one. See ya. See you, yeah. Robbie. All right, bye. Wonderful. So uh, that was pretty intense, huh? We dove into some yeah. crazy stuff, right? First, I, you know, I, 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 I think that I know what's going to happen. You we think talk you about know what's going to happen? Uh, we talk about things. You have an understanding, whether it's Facebook or it's Instagram and things like that. And then you really get to know somebody, and you 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 realize that even though I didn't have a bad perspective about Robbie, but there's so much more to people, and I think that's one of the best parts, one of the things I'm most excited about this podcast is we're going to be able to dig in and really get to know people because I instantaneously like this dude. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I think he's incredible, so I just can't wait to I can't wait to meet him now. I'm mean, I'm excited about it. You know, yeah. like dude, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to meet y'all. <laughs> am I supposed Am I supposed to be still linked in here? Am You're I, not. Am I that's like okay. A fly on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. You are. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, dude, I, I'm I'm super excited about meeting y'all. And honestly, doing this podcast with y'all has gotten me like over my pussy ass fears of doing my own podcast. Oh, really? So, awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah, I've been really wanting to do something because I got I got a lot of perspective and I got a lot of weird shit to talk about that could possibly help some people. There so you go. I definitely want to. This is this is giving me a lot more courage to put myself out there in the same fashion. So awesome. I, I appreciate you meeting yeah. y'all. So. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we all gained a lot of perspective on each other from this one. Yeah, so. for sure. Totally. I uh, can't wait, man. Well, I got to get to work, and it was great meeting you guys. So now, now I'll leave you and stop being a creep that isn't supposed to be in the conversation. <laughs> it's all good. Hashtag, <laughs> hashtag creeper, right? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much, man. Uh, oh, shit. oh sorry about that. That's yeah. Okay, that was rude. That's all right. that's <laughs> but I mean, that's I don't know. 
You don't he know. Inst- he instantaneously liked the guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, I can't wait right to meet him. I can't wait to meet him. Yeah. And Very you cool. know, you were saying bef- uh, <laughs> when we thought Robbie had uh, had you know got off the phone, you you were saying you know I can see how this is going to go. Well, my assumptions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my assumptions are that. He's a tattoo artist. We're going to talk about certain things. We're going to hit on certain topics. You know, I had the whole Sundance thing planned, but I just like how conversations have their own life and they take on this their own thing. Right. And you discover more than you ever thought you'd, you'd find out. I like that. Right. And I can also see this podcast helping out a lot of people and taking us on this journey. Every time we meet somebody, they're like, hey, you got to try this. Have you not tried this? We haven't tried this. Come down and hang out with me for a weekend. And I don't know yeah. why I just blurt out things like, oh, I want to do that. We should get together. <laughs> but uh-huh. I think I, I, I see – when you see people like Robbie who are so positive and so excited about what they're doing, it makes you go, oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll give that a shot. I, I don't know what it's about, but – and it sounds scary. But if he is walking around and he's just fine, that sounds right. great, you know? I think it comes down to a lot of times, you know, I mean, you just kind of blurted it out, like you say, but, you know, when you when you put it out there kind of into the universe, as, as Robbie mentioned, it's really easy once you kind of manifest it into this thing that's not floating around up here right. to become like how fast he's like, come to Florida, come to Chicago, you're, you're not far from Chicago, come right over, let's do it. We know people like that fast. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm excited about, too, with, with the show. I mean, he brought up suicide, you know, 15 minutes in. And like that's intense, yes. right? But what's yeah. so great about it is is not only was he comfortable, like you mentioned, it's going to help. It's going to help people discover themselves, discover obviously new topics, you know. Right, and, yeah. and really, I'm hoping it helped. I f- I feel like today's show helped me grow, yeah. so I can only imagine what listeners are going to feel as well. I think that's so intense. Well, that's the whole purpose of the show, right? Yeah, exactly. You got it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, everybody out there listening, please be sure to hit us up on iTunes, Stitcher. YouTube, joshuacoburn.com. If you have kind of a topic you want us to cover, you can hit it up at joshuacoburn.com too under Well Razor Society. There's a little form you can fill out and let us know what you want us to discuss. If there's a certain topic we can cover before or after uh, the show, we certainly will. Uh, you can find all of us, I think, on the Facebooks, the internet, anywhere, basically, um, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Uh, if you're struggling, though, if you're having issues, suicide, depression, anxiety, or what the heck ever else, at joshuacoburn.com, you can find the Relief and Resource Center, which will definitely help you out, hopefully, and make you feel possibly less alone. That's what it's all about. Um, so remember, here at Wellraiser Radio, it's always a safe place for us to hang out, and there's always... No judgment. And kindness. Just kindness. Just kindness. Just kindness. It's all right. One of these days you'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Take care.